want to uh, thank you for joining me this morning for my webinar. This webinar is on the secrets of high-end garment screen printing. It's a topic that I'm uh, very passionate about because, as you all know, I probably probably know I do separations uh, all day long, and I deal with screen printers, large and small. And I often find that I have to do a little bit of hand-holding, a little bit of babysitting to get them to understand how to do high-end printing, and that high-end printing is not athletic printing. It's not ink slapping and corporate logos. It's much different than that. So this topic is dear to my heart. Points. This is not going to be a complete webinar on how to make screens or how to do separations. This is going to tell you the secrets of high-end printing, and some of these topics you'll have to explore in more detail. I think there's probably only about eight or nine real important points for doing high-end garment screen printing. In fact, if you're even a beginner, you could do a high-end print. I'm convinced of that, and I've shown people how they can do that. So the question is, what is high-end printing? To me, high-end printing is uh, photorealistic, detailed images, picky customer, could be a big customer, images that have a lot going on. So this topic is this kind of images as opposed to ink slapping corporate logos and don't take that the wrong way your bread and butter is ink slapping but you'll get jobs like this in and I find that a lot of my separation customers get only four or five of these type of jobs per year others of you do this stuff every day but to me high-end printing has a lot going on a lot of detail a lot of gradations a lot of shading typically built in Photoshop although many times like this bug out image could be built in Adobe Illustrator or Corel Draw and then separated in Photoshop so to me, high-end means photorealistic in most cases. And, and I think it's easy. Uh, <laughs> you'll think, well, he's crazy. To me, it's easy. In fact, I wrote articles uh, a few articles years ago. That my, the articles were titled, High-End Printing Made Easy. And of course, I can make it sound real easy. Get a great piece of artwork. Well, we know that that doesn't always happen. Uh, a great set of color separations. That's always the, uh, the tough one, whether you do them yourself or send them out or use an automated program make a great screen and I find I fight with screen makers all the time who don't do this kind of screen making and all of a sudden the artist gives them a job that has little tiny 5% half tone dots and they say we can't do that uh, and then great printing technique meaning you don't kill it this is not four or five strokes this is not athletic printing this is a little finesse and have a happy customer so high-end printing to me is is not hard you just kind of follow some of the basic rules I am a color separator and I do sell an automated program so you're going to think this is somewhat self-serving but I can tell you that I could take any beginner and if I can show them how to make a decent screen which is not going to be that difficult if I gave them a good set of separations they could do a high-end print I'm convinced of that I've seen it I've done it in the field and so the separations are everything and so many of you will struggle with the separations uh, and then your prints won't turn out that well and it's odd in that with spot color printing, it's kind of funny. You can give me a uh, athletic spot color print with three or four Pantone matches and colors touching colors. That is much harder than doing high-end printing I, because you're, you're dealing with butt register, maybe a little bit of trapping, thick inks. This kind of printing, high-end printing, to me is much easier to print, very forgiving, actually. So even a marginal printer can do killer shirt prints with a good set of separations. I'm convinced of that. Your choices are do your own seps, and that's fine. And if you're doing uh, basic stuff in AI or Corel Draw, then then it's probably not high end. But your dilemma is going to be when you get that photo in of that festival shirt or that 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 rod run or that race or that motorcycle shirt. So your choices are do your own seps. Use automated programs like TSEPs, and of course there's competitors out there, and you can try them all. Everybody has has free trials. Or you can buy separations from a pro separator. You can buy from me. I have a flat fee of $75 for any number of colors. You can email me at scott at tbiznetwork.com. There's lots of other separators out there. You can look at some of the trade magazines and find them. Do a web search and find them. There's lots of separators out there. And I think at the end of the day, your choice is spend hours doing your own seps if you're new to this and struggling with it or pay someone to do it and get that out of your hair and worry more about running your business and printing the shirts and marketing and selling and not try and be everything to everybody. The difference between uh, doing it yourself or using automated programs and the pro separators is that the automated programs and a, and a pro separator knows how to adjust for dot gain. We know all about what's going to happen when you put that ink on a shirt and so we adjust for that in the SEPs and that's where Corel Draw and AI when you're doing separations in those programs they really aren't, aren't it isn't easy to adjust for dot gain in those programs and so typically a pro separator or the automated programs do all this for you 
for dark shirts, the secret really is a great underbase, and an underbase is more than just making a negative of the file and printing it with white ink. An underbase has lots going on, and I always like to tell people when they use my program, especially that if you if your underbase looks good, chances are your print's going to look dynamite, because the underbase is everything. And so that's where what separates, I think, doing it yourself and struggling. A pro separator knows how to work with the artwork. I get half the files I get in are junky files that are low quality JPEGs and a good separator knows how to how to adjust. I'm not trying to sell you my separation services by the way it may sound like it. I'm just telling you that that's an option for you whether it be me or uh, Dot Tone Dan or any of the guys out there doing separations that a lot of times it's almost easier just to give it to somebody and say here separate it for me because what did I say a second ago the separations are everything and the topic today is the secrets of high-end printing and a, a good separator knows how to adjust for plastisol printing wet on wet are for discharge printing. If you like this topic, by the way, there's a couple of good articles on my website at tbiznetwork.com. Just click on articles in the tabs across the top. One is how to do simulated process color separations without using an automated program, just the step by steps of how to do it. And one is how to do index color separations, just the step by steps without using any automated program. So if you like the topic of doing color separations, uh, there's information out there. There's lots of YouTube stuff out there. Go to the TBiz Network channel on YouTube, and there's lots of excellent videos there and lots of other guys doing stuff. Remember what I said a second ago. I'm going to hound you on this, and that's the separations are everything. Yes, screen making is everything, but I think if you can make one screen, you can make a dozen screens. Once I can teach you how to do a good halftone dot on a screen, that's no big deal. But the steps are the ones that always require some finesse. Think of the automated separations programs as doing the heavy lifting. They kind of do the grunt work. Obviously, I use my program when I work every day doing SEPs, but then I spend maybe another five or ten minutes, maybe a half hour, maybe an hour doing final tweaks. And so the separation programs do all the heavy lifting. And those of you that are the uh, computer junkies that go, well, I don't need those programs. I do it myself. I'm okay with that. As long as your SEPs turn out and as long as you don't spend two or three hours doing it, uh, then I'm okay with that. If you like the automated separation program topic, there was a webinar that I did a few weeks ago that was on TSEPs, and you might check that out and just watch it if you want to get up to speed on what these automated programs do. Okay, this is Photoshop, and I want to talk real quickly about, for those of you that are new to automated separation program, this is a file that was separated using a program called TSEPs. And if you're using uh, any of the other automated separation programs, they're all very similar. They build what's called channel separations. And these are called channels. Channels print in Photoshop, and so the automated separations programs take a great piece of artwork and convert it into individual channels. So this is the high end, meaning you've got a great piece of artwork. This piece of artwork, artwork was actually built in uh, layers in Photoshop, and it's a great piece of artwork. So here's the, the problem. What you get is not that. You get something different than that. Let me show you what you get in. And the problem is, on the art side, is the resolution of the file. This is a close-up, and I'll zoom in on it, of two pieces of artwork that came from the same piece of artwork, two files that came from the same piece of artwork, but that were opened in Photoshop two different ways. And the file on the left is only 72 DPI. So the problem is, when you separate this, and remember, the topic is high-end screen printing. When you separate this, your image is soft. I get files all day long where customers will send me a piece of artwork and say, Scott, I want you to separate it. Uh, can you use this file? And my response is so often, I just need to make a macro for it in my email. Don't you have a better version of the artwork? And of course, the response is typically, no, this is all I got from the customer. It is what it is. But this is 72 DPI. The same image on the right is 450 DPI. Now, this is a difference in how this file was opened in Photoshop. And so this is the kind of file we want this is the kind of file we get and there's not magic sometimes you know if you're going to separate this thing uh, your separation programs are if you separate it yourself manually you're going to see these lighter shades of color these gray levels and it's going to be a mess the difference by the way on this file was how the file was opened in Photoshop let me show you what I mean this is actually a uh, an image that I just did a screen grab of this is the original file here let me close out this file. What you get, 72 DPI, JPEG, small physical size, what you want, 300 DPI, final size if possible. I would say probably maybe half the time I get this, but normally I get this from customers. And so you need to learn how to fix the bad artwork. So you got to start off with a piece of artwork. It is what it is. If that's all the customer has, it is what it is, but hopefully you're going to get a decent piece of artwork. And it should be 300 DPI at final size if possible. 
So again, I just showed you that image on the left is the 72 DPI, the right is 450. Now you're asking me why 450 when you just said 300. The standard has always been 300 DPI, and that's fine for most people, but I know some of you are what I like to call my vector snobs. And vector snobs, here I'll go back and show you what I mean here. There's, there's the term vector snob. Vector snob means that you're really, you hate Jaggies, you love AI, you love Corel, you don't want to see any pixels, and you hate to have your file that came out of AI screwed up in Photoshop. Well, if that's the case, then bring it into Photoshop at 450 DPI. Bring it into 600 DPI. Bring it into 700 DPI. I do separations for one of the car, car companies, uh, race cars, one of the larger companies, and they want me to do the steps at 600 DPI. I'm okay with that because computers are faster. We've got plenty of RAM now. We have plenty of speed. In the old days, that would be working with a two or 300 megabyte file would be out of the question, but now it's no big deal. And so... The deal is this, so if you open a file in, that you build in AI or Corel, if you open that file up, there's a chance you might screw that thing up. Let me show you what I mean in Photoshop real quick. If I go to File, Open in Photoshop, and I'm bringing a file out of AI or Corel, and this is not a artwork seminar, but it's very important to work at the final resolution, if possible, the right resolution. If I bring a file into Photoshop that was built in AI or Corel as a PDF, or an EPS, the window you get is this window right here, and the default resolution is 72 DPI anti-aliasing. You want to make sure you turn anti-aliasing off. That is what's going to soften edges, and you want to make the file the right resolution, 450. If you don't do that, your file is going to be jagged, and so you've got to not blow by that window. Whenever you're working in Photoshop, try and work, if you can, with anti-aliasing turned off. I zoom in on this file. This was built in a vector program. Okay, I see some jaggies if I zoom really far in. I'm not going to worry about that. That is no big deal. And so it's very important to save files or export as an EPS or a PSD out of vector programs if you're building in those programs. Turn, make sure to turn off anti-aliasing when you bring them into Photoshop and keep the resolution at 300 dpi or higher. Don't be afraid to do unsharp masking, lighten images a little bit, improve the hue saturation. Learn how to improve low quality JPEG images. Good example of that is, uh, let me bring up another file here real quick. We'll get off this art topic in a second, but to me you can tell that I will spend more time fixing artwork and less time separating sometimes. This is an example I've used many times of a low quality JPEG image. If you zoom in on this image, what you're going to see is what I call the boxes, and that's these little, these little boxy areas here. Zoom in. Well, those all separate, and the boxes are, if you look at the RGB individually, you can see that there's some definite issues here. So you've got to learn how to improve low-quality JPEG images. If you like this topic, I did a web webinar called Fixing Bad Artwork uh, that you can watch that is on this entire topic of fixing bad artwork. Now, uh, as an example, TCEPS has a routine built into it, and there's lots of programs out there. I'm just showing you things that happen to have TCEPS open, but TCEPS has a routine built into it that will improve this quite a bit. And again, there's lots, of, uh, there's lots of programs out there that will do this kind of stuff. Let's look at the RGB. Okay, I'm going to just run, run my routine. It's improve low-quality JPEG. Don't blink. It's thinking. See the difference? Huge difference. Now it softened it slightly, but I got rid of all the boxes. Those are called artifacts in some cases, and I got rid of those. This thing's going to separate much better. Now it's not, it's not going to be great because look how jaggy this thing is, but it improved the low-quality JPEG. So these are things you need to work on. Learn how to improve low-quality JPEGs. Watch my webinar on that. Learn how to make areas that are white, dead white, make them dead black. Learn about all this, and you can do that at a webinar that I did called Fixing Bad Artwork at tbiznetwork.com. It's about 45 minutes long, and it covers a lot of stuff on fixing bad artwork. Spend time on choking and trapping. If you have any solid text areas and underbases below them, you can't let that underbase peek out. Now, this is not a webinar on that. In fact, there is a webinar on how to use TCEPs, which happens to have a section on choking and trapping. So whether you want to use TCEPs or not, there's a section on it in the webinar on how to do choking and trapping. Trapping is where you spread a fill color, so typically it goes underneath a black outline or a dark outline. That's called a trap, and that helps you to eliminate any out-of-register areas when you're at press. Choking is typically reducing the size, also known as a skinny. 
So a trap is typically called a fatty, it fattens things up. A choke is called a skinny, where it skinnies or makes thinner the underbase so the top color falls off of it. And it's important to learn about this. There's articles on my website in the article section on choking and trapping. Again, our topic today is high-end garment screen printing. And these are the little things that make a difference. You know, you walk into a store and you see a great looking print, and if you're like me, the first thing you look at is seeing if you see white peek out around things on dark shirts, and a good print you don't. You almost have to turn the shirt inside out and stretch it to see if there's a white base below it. That's because somebody spent time on choking back the underbase or spreading the top color. So film output. We know we now have a decent set of separations, been adjusted for dot gain. Everything's kind of tweaked nicely. Film output. Your needs are good ink density. Your needs are stability of the film so it doesn't shrink and, and be out of register. Your needs are good transparency so it burns a decent screen. And your needs are the ability to create halftone dots. Somehow, some way, for high-end printing, especially if you have to take an image that has gray levels in it and convert it to halftone dots. And boy, if you look at just even my sample here, you can see the, the detail loss because you're taking an image with lots of little subtle areas and you're converting it to these huge dots and then trying to hold those dots on the screen. And that's not an easy task, but that's what you've got to deal with. Many of you that are ink slappers, and again, I don't, I'm not talking down to you when I talk ink slappers, that's your bread and butter, but many of you that do never do halftone dots, this will be a new experience for you. I talk to new printers all the time, or even old printers who say, I've never done a halftone dot, now I have a job that I need to have halftone dots and I'm concerned about it. And so you have to have a way to do halftone dots. Your goal, by the way, is to hold those dots. That means hold those dots on the film, hold those dots on the screen, hold those dots on the shirt. You're going to hear me say that over and over again. If you ever took any of my seminars on high-end printing, it's always my mantra is hold those dots. So your choices are vellum, those of you that still have lasers that are on their last legs. I still do separations for people that print with vellum. Not a great choice because it's not very stable. The halftones aren't very dense so that the exposure light burns through them. And so that would not be my number one choice for high-end printing. That's all you have. That's all you have. So if you have vellum, you need to learn how to spray it down with the toner black or whatever you've got that will make the toner black or buy some Aquanet at the, at the uh, drugstore and spray your vellums with that. It will make the toner very, very dark. The, uh, the uh, flavor of the month is direct-to-screen DTS. Very expensive, $40,000 plus. But that's, I, I do a lot of steps now for people that are, that are using direct-to-screen. No film, no registration issues. You inkjet directly on a coated screen, then you expose it. No vacuum table needed because your inkjet is, is on the actual emulsion. Very, very sexy. I can see that as it's becoming sexier and sexier, the prices are going to come down somewhat. Inkjet film is a reliable solution, and it's very low cost, and inkjet is really today's standard. Thermal film, like an OIO, is also somewhat standard, but somewhat expensive to maintain, thousands of dollars to replace a, a, a thermal in, uh, heat head, and the film is somewhat expensive. So you've got to find a way to do film output that's going to satisfy our need of high-end printing on garments. Inkjet now is the standard, for sure. Years ago, it was laser printers, because your choices were 12, 15 years ago, laser printer or image setter. And image setters were thirty and forty thousand dollars. Now you can buy an Epson fourteen thirty inkjet printer for three hundred dollars or less from Staples. These printers don't do half tone dots and don't lay enough ink down on clear film. Couple that with what's called a rip, and I've got a rip, of course, there's other rips out there, but a rip tells a dumb inkjet printer to do half tone dots and how to lay down more ink. And rips are typically $400, inkjet printers $300 for $700 or less. You have really what would be considered years ago image setter. You have image setter quality, beautiful halftone dots, perfect registration, and uh, you're going to love it if you've never done it. Now, let's talk about film output. Again, we have our device then, our inkjet printer or our thermal or our laser printer. For simple designs, especially if you're using vellum output, I would probably go 45 LPI. LPI is the frequency of dots per inch, called the lines per inch. But that seems a little odd because we also talk about DPI, dots per inch. So the LPI is the number of halftone dots per inch. In fact, if you're doing a real simple design, you've got really poor non uh, non-industry laser printer, like an off-the-shelf laser printer from an office store, you might go 35 LPI. For more complex designs, I would do 55 LPI. 
that's typically how I set separations I send out because I know that a lot of my customers are not doing real critical stuff and maybe they struggle with screen making a little bit and so I'll make it 55 LPI. 65 LPI is kind of the standard for higher end printers who have stuff with lots of detail. Some of the images I showed you in the very beginning were 65 line half tones. I like an angle of the half tone dot of 25 degrees to minimize moray. I'm not sure if you can see the moray in this pattern here, but this is a moray. Moray is this pattern. This is not desirable. This is not in the actual graphic. This is what happens if you put half tone dots on screen mesh. You pick up these optical patterns. Now, some of you use 22 and a half. Some of you use 61 and a half. I really don't care what angle you use as long as you minimize moray. Some of you find that, it, that a, a round dot actually gives you maybe a little less moray than an elliptical dot. Elliptical dots are like an egg, and that's the normal dot shape you would choose when you're out putting film. And the reason for that is that when you're doing halftone dots, ellipses burn a little better in what's called the mid-tone area, the 50% area where the dots go from a dot to a reverse dot. So typically, when I'm setting out separations, I'll set it for 55 LPI, 25 degree angle, dot shape of ellipse. Screen making. Typically, now, I have it both ways for you. I have it in centimeters and inches. If you're an a international user, you're thinking in centimeters. Typically, most of my customers use 230 for the underbase on the highlight and 305 for the top colors. Now, your problem is your screen makers are going, we can't do that. We don't have meshes that high. And I'm just telling you, if you want to do high-end printing, you've got to invest in some high mesh counts. It's not cheap, but you've just got to bite the bullet and buy some high mesh count screens. Try and keep the screens to 25 newtons if possible if you have a tension meter. If you're buying them pre-stretched, hopefully whoever you're buying them from is selling them to you uh, at the proper tension. I have no problem with pre-stretched rigid aluminum screens. Even some of the pre-stretched wood screens that are coated are fine for, most, for a lot of your average work. But if you can, at least get pre-stretched uh, aluminum screens or retentionable screens. If you want to be a high-end printer, you need to have an attention meter. You need to know what it is. Otherwise, it's an unknown. You don't know how tight your screens are. For screen making, I'm a big fan of two-part dual cure emulsions. This is an older photograph of uh, Chromalines UDC-2. I think it's now UDC-4, UDC-5. UDC stands for Universal Dual Cure. And a two-part emulsion, if you're thinking, wow, I have to mix it, it's got a shelf life, I don't like that. All I can tell you is a two-part emulsion is more forgiving when you're exposing your screen. It has an exposure time that is not so fast that you have no latitude because some of the, the uh, single-part pre-mixed emulsions, they're called a pure photopolymer, they're pretty fast. If you have a really high-end light source, you might be burning a screen in 10 seconds, 15, 20 seconds. That's too fast. There's no latitude. You, have, you really are either underexposed or overexposed. So I like a two-part dual cure. I like to use a coater on the sharp edge and do a coat on the outside and the inside. Keep the coating thin and then use the proper exposure time. I can't tell you how many times people have sent me shirt samples and said, what happened here? And there is no halftone dots below 20 or 30 percent. There's no dots. And if the image had detail in that area, had information, and the films had a little dots in that area, and the dots did not end up on the screen, they don't end up on the shirt, and the print looks washed out. What I say earlier, hold those dots. This is important. Typically, if someone emails me and says, I, I just did a print, it looks pretty washed out, uh, my response, of course, is, did you hold those dots? And they're going, I don't know. And I'll say, well, do a print of the screen and compare that print to your film. Or take the screen, hold it up to the light, and compare it to the film. Did you hold the dots down as low as the 5%? And typically the answer is no. And typically the reason is because of overexposure. They expose too long. There's a device called an exposure calculator that is a film you can buy. I'm not sure what they sell for now. They used to be $30 or $40. They might be more now. This is from Chromaline, which is an emulsion company that, that's uh, widely sold through all the industry suppliers. This will show you a number of exposure times and it will show you if you can hold down to a 5% dot or a 2% dot. It's really a tool that you can use. Now you can make your own. Just go into Photoshop or into AI and put a bunch of squares and fill it with tints and output it at, at a 55 line half tone and burn a screen and see can you hold the 5% dot? Can you hold the 10% dot? Typically when I deal with screen makers who are complaining that 
they can't hold the dots, typically my question to them is, what's your exposure time? And the response typically is, oh, I do it for three minutes for all my screens. And I go, you mean you burn for three minutes for a 156 or a 230 or a 305? Oh, sure. And my response is, wow, if you burn three minutes for 156, why don't you try uh, maybe 45 seconds for a 305? And, of course, the response is typically, that'll never work. And my response is always, try it. Humor me, trust me. You can go much lower for the higher mesh counts. So you've got to just play with this. I'm going to back up for a second on this. You've got to play with it. You've got to work on the thin coats, proper exposure times, use a calculator or make your own. Uh, make sure and don't blow the whole screen out. That screen needs to be washed out a little carefully. And hold those dots. The best thing you could invest in is what's called a loop. I haven't got a picture of a loop here, but it's a little magnifier. You can go to Radio Shack and buy a magnifier, but also art stores carry them. It's called a loop or a little glass. And you actually look at the shirts, look at your screens, Look at your films. For your press setup, you're going to set up your press with a nice low off contact. Now, that's easy to say, but if you have a uh, warped wooden frames and maybe uh, shirt boards that have had too much heat applied with their flash unit and they're warped, hard to get level pallets. Uh, but the secret to high-end printing is to not have those dots that are little 5% dots not have these dots grow. Notice on this slide here, the 80% dot really is a, almost a solid. On the film, that was a dot. The 50% looks more like a 60 or 70%. This is called dot gain, and your goal is to minimize dot gain. Try and get the dots to not grow that much. Again, back to the separations, a good separator will adjust for dot gain. He will know you're going to get 30 or 40% dot gain at press, and he will adjust for that and make the separations a little weaker, actually. So when you burn them on screens and print them and the dots grow, it becomes the right size dot. So the secret to the printing end is if your palettes aren't level, your screens aren't laying really flat with a very low off contact, you're going to get more dot gain. And in some cases, this 30% dot might even grow to be a 50 or 60%. That means your whole design is going to start turning muddy. So what happens if you're new to this process is you don't hold the little 5% dots on the screen. You kill it when you print it, and the whole thing turns a little muddy, and you wonder how come your prints don't look like the prints you see in Walmart. So low off contact, I'm talking uh, 16 to an eighth of an inch, very, very low. Level palettes, proper squeegee. The, the most popular squeegees are called triple durometers. There's a newer one out called a 50-90-50. That means that the outside rubber is 50 durometers, the inside little stiffener is 90 durometers, and the other outside is 50. That's good. That means you have a little softer edge on the outside, but a nice uh, support on the inside. A standard 70-90-70 is, is pretty much uh, standard in the industry. Uh, and it's going to give you good rigidity, but uh, nice, clean, kind of a flexible edge. For the inks, you're going to use a high opacity plastisol for the underbase. Oh, heck, we can't get that through a 230. Yes, you can. That's, again, a common, common thought I get when I tell somebody to, make, to put the base on a 230. Wow, can I get white through that? Don't be afraid to reduce your inks a little bit if necessary. Just reduce them a little bit. Get them a little smooth and creamy. Common thinking is you reduce the inks and uh, you lose opacity. But here's the deal. If your inks are real thick and you're having to apply excessive squeegee pressure to drive them into the shirt, you're driving them into the shirt, not laying it on top of the shirt. If you reduce your inks just a little bit so they're creamy and smooth and you can use less squeegee pressure, you now are printing on top of the shirt and you're laying the ink on top and you're going to have better opacity. It's one of those weird deals where the the newbie or the printer who never does half-tone dots always thinks, wow, I have to keep that ink nice and thick. So don't be afraid to add a little bit of reducer, get it nice and creamy. The top colors all go through with the 305 mesh or the 120 if you're a foreign user. And uh, again, you're thinking, I can't get it through the 305. Certainly you can. Most regular all-purpose plastisols are pretty smooth and creamy. So the goal is to be open-minded. Yes, you can get white through a 230. Yes, you can get all-purpose through a 305 mesh. Just buy into it. When you walk into Walmart or Sears or wherever, and you look at those hot shirts, black shirts especially, that are the licensed properties. They've got the, the Spider-Man and all the different licensed characters. Those are being done exactly like this. Now, the hot, trendy thing is discharge for the base. That's very trendy, and you need to play with that. Print a discharge base. Discharge ink is ink that actually bleaches out or removes the dye from the garment and leaves just the garment color. And in many cases now, the discharge inks have a little bit of whiteners in them. And so you have now a soft, no-hand base that you print now your plastisols through for the top colors. 
This is a tough one because some of the shirts now are very thin, and I even like wearing a little thinner shirt. But the thinner the shirt, the weaker the print will look, and it'll look a little a little thin. There's nowhere for the ink to go. So try and use 100% cotton. That'll give you no bleeding. Okay, the customer says I want 50/50 red. Your goal is to talk them out of that because you're, the whiting's going to bleed a little bit. So some final touches, kind of a, a recap and some final loose ends. The print order should be lightest to darkest or smallest ink area to largest ink area. That helps minimize pickup on the bottom of the screens. If you have a little tiny area of yellow but it's a key little logo, you might print that towards the end. It's not a very big area. Uh, but typically you would print the underbase first. Typically you're going to flash cure once, maybe twice. I would always put the mesh count, the print order, and the Pantone number on the film so that everybody knows what's going on. I would set my frequency to 55 or 65 LPI, angle 25 degrees for all colors, dot shape ellipse. Just recapping here. This is not athletic printing. Keep flashing to a minimum, meaning you print the underbase. Maybe it takes a couple strokes on the base, no doubt about it. Flash cure it, and then everything else is wet on wet if possible. If it's a 7 or 8 color job or a 10 color job, you may have to flash somewhere down the end. If it's a job where you've got a corporate logo and it's maybe that yellow ink and it's got to jump off the shirt, you might print that later in the sequence and flash before that. So on the manual press, that's no big deal. If you have a 6 color auto with one flash, you're kind of in trouble. If you have a 10 or 12 color auto that's got a couple flashes, you're good to go. It typically takes a few prints for the image to kind of come around and start to settle in. So don't judge it by your very first print. If you've never done high-end printing before, you'd be blown away by the first print. But it takes a few prints for the inks to kind of settle in, the dot gain to kind of settle in. You settle in on how you stroke it, how much pressure you use, the speed of the stroke. And if possible, if you're doing dark shirts and your separator has given you a highlight white, try not to eliminate that and say, well, I don't need that. The highlight white is that last color down that would usually kiss the other colors and make them a little brighter on dark shirts. That's all I've got. That was a wham-bam. If you like these topics, again, go to my website at tbiznetwork.com. Look at my articles. There's some good articles there. Go to my T YouTube uh, channel and watch some of the YouTubes. There's over 100 YouTube ch uh, videos on my YouTube channel that cover many of these topics in much more detail. But if we can summarize, it is a great set of steps, a great screen that we hold the dots on, good film output with nice dense dots that will burn properly on a screen, proper press setup, and a happy customer. I've enjoyed talking with you guys. Don't be afraid to send me an email and let's discuss this further. Thanks a lot for attending. Bye-bye.